All right, my friends, are you ready for another uh, Build Show Live? we got a great topic today. We're doing all q and I've got Paul Evans with me. I've got a giant list of your questions that you send in ahead of time. And, of course, we're recording this, so uh, this will be available on buildshownetwork.com later. Uh, but let me introduce Paul first as we get started here. And, uh, Paul, looks like we've got 150 people uh, and counting. So let's give it, actually, before you introduce yourself, let's give it one more minute uh, so that the new people coming on will know who you are. Uh, guys, if you're tuning in for the first time, you've never done one of these live events before, on your Zoom link, or on your Zoom screen, I should say, uh, there's a chat feature on there. We don't use that, so don't don't uh, don't use that. Just abandon that tab. However, if you've got a question that comes up during the webinar and you want Paul or I to answer that towards the end, we're going to leave some Q and A time for your questions at the end. And so there's a Q and A tab that I will be monitoring. There's no open questions on there at the moment, but if you would type your question in there, we're going to leave some time at the end. But in general, this is a little bit different of a format. You know, in the past, we've done a lot of these webinars where we're talking about a specific product or a process. Uh, in this case, Builders First Source, longtime partner of the Build Show, sent out a message to all of their customers saying, hey, Paul and Matt are going to be available for this webinar. And this is the list of the questions. <laughs> you guys had some great ones. And believe it or not, this is even consolidated a little bit. We had a lot of good response. Um, so with that being said, let me introduce Paul Evans to you. So Paul has been with BFS for literally 40 years now, right, Paul? Yeah, you could say 30 years with the actual BFS uh, company, but 40 years because now BFS owns all the companies I ever worked for. So <laughs> That's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. And Paul is the VP of Millwork and Innovation. Um, but I would tell you or I would make an argument that Paul is the most interesting man in the building world. <laughs> Uh, because he's also the license holder for uh, BFS in uh, in the fact that they do installed work as well. So how many how many contractors states licenses do you actually hold for BFS? So twenty eight licenses uh, in twenty two different states. Holy so, cow! Yeah, and that's one of our questions we're going to get to in a little bit. Is uh, talk to us about licensure and what should I know? So we're going to get to that in a little bit, but. Paul, I say we jump right in. We got a lot of good questions here. Fantastic! I love it, and I love the way you held this till the very end. So you're going to catch me, you know, ad lib on some of this. So <laughs> go. All right. First question. Let's jump right in here. Uh, Paul, this one's for you. How do we get more consistent pricing for millwork items, or a volume discount on millwork? And they said for a mid-sized builder, but I'd also add advice for custom builders like me as we think about getting better pricing or better kind of volume discounts uh, from BFS. Yeah, so this was the first question on the top. So I read that one and have kind of some insight there. Uh, the production builders have been doing this for a few years where they will come in and they will say, hey, we've got a, uh, a community of 150 homes and we've got this much money uh, set aside as budget for millwork. How can we do that? And what we do is we narrow their options down mm -hmm. uh, instead of them offering whatever, 20 base and 15 casing options and four different door pro, uh, styles. We narrow that down to one or two or three. Sure. And then we buy large volume volumes of that for that community and we can uh, not only hold the price but we can also guarantee a price for that so if you're a mid-size builder or even a custom builder for that matter ask your salesperson uh, at BFS hey what items do you buy in bulk already that you have available. Let me see those profiles. And instead of you as a custom builder saying, hey, just go to BFS and pick up whatever case and basing you mm -hmm. want, pick from these five or pick from the, even these two. And the same thing on the door style. If you pick these two door styles, I can get a better deal than if you pick everything. Now, as a custom builder, uh, especially a cost plus builder like yourself, you, you, you don't really care what they have. But if you've got a budget conscious job, where you can say, hey, if you want this thing to come into budget, mm -hmm. you gotta stick with these two styles and these two door styles yeah. and these two molding styles. That's the way to do it. And you know, I would say that even very particular custom building clients would appreciate that information, knowing that they maybe bought a Lexus or a Cadillac last week. They only had two choices of leather on that, on that Cadillac, right? They had a black and a brown color. They couldn't choose pink or purple or green, and they didn't necessarily want that anyways. So by you limiting their choices, 
and, and giving them a better price, but having more readily available materials, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. The other, the other side of a custom builder, think about it this, if you have four base choices that are all the same price and you can pick one of those, it doesn't mean that they can only have to pick one. Think about that. How many times have you stack blocked a base or stack blocked a crown mold, yep. but you use standard pieces to do that? Yeah. You get a great look at an inexpensive price. Yeah, so that's, that's the way to answer that. Uh, as a follow-up to that too, I'm, I'm a huge trim guy too. I, I love uh, houses that, that I call the tribute to trim houses <laughs> where you've got a lot of finished carpentry going on. I did that at my personal house. Uh, and my buddy Brent Hall worked with a particular mill company called Windsor One to develop a catalog mm -hmm. of moldings that kind of worked with any particular style. And I used their uh, Greek revival style. Uh, when I was with a production builder back in the day, we had these molding boards that would show you know here's here's the corner of a uh, door casing and here's the uh, base profiles that fit in this i think we had like four packages that people could choose from i suspect that even custom builders might be able to get that sort of uh, molding package help from BFS, is that true? Oh, definitely can. Uh, we have sample uh, boards or sample pieces that the builder can make their own sample boards out of them. That goes back to my stack block idea. Just think about taking a standard sample piece that costs you nothing or minimal, mm -hmm. and then making your own board with a stack up and the customer feels, hey, they're getting something custom, which they are, yeah. because no one else had put in that, that pattern together That's with right. that. So it's amazing that you, you brought up uh, uh, Brent Hull because, uh, you know, he has a, a, an unbelievable library of old style moldings. Yeah. Uh, and we went through those moldings. I went through those moldings with him one time and came up with some generics that we're using today. Uh, so just because something is old doesn't mean it's not the latest and greatest trend yeah. because it's coming back. That's so, a great point. Yeah. Love it. Uh, Paul, here's one for both of us. Uh, houses today are being built much smaller to address affordability. I heard some stat about the kind of average house size uh, that American builders are building is a couple hundred square feet smaller than it was a few years ago, kind of pre-pandemic. Uh, how can we make them more appealing with millwork? And I would include in their windows, doors, and molding. So I'm going to answer on my side of it, and then you can answer on your side of it. On my side of it, again, don't give up on the millwork. Uh, and, and everybody gives me a hard time when I say that. They go, well, that's where you get paid. And that's I the said, millwork guy yeah, talking. Yeah, I'm the millwork guy talking. But millwork is where the house is made. Yeah. People walk through and they go, guy, those beautiful two befores? No. No. Yeah. They're Wide looking, open, drywalled spaces. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and with just a little bit of, of excitement on the base and a little bit of excitement on the casing. Yeah. And also, don't forget crown mold. We're building more and more contemporary homes. Mm -hmm. But don't forget... There are contemporary crown molds available. The old LS50, you and I were talking about yeah. that at lunch. LS50 is as contemporary as they come, That's and it's been point. around for years and yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, a simple, and you do one or two rooms in that, and maybe even paint it a different color, mm -hmm. which costs nothing to do. Yep. What a difference that makes. Built-ins. It's amazing the number of people who have dropped the built-ins over the years because their house got so big they couldn't afford it. Well, now the, the house is smaller, Put in those built-ins. Yeah. Put it. Have your cabinet company come up with a built-in, or or have the job site cabinet guy uh, build the cabinet and build it that built-in for you. What a difference that makes! Huge. Totally huge difference. agree. Yeah. I've always been a big fan of build smaller and build better. Uh, and in fact, one book that I recommend to a lot of people, or I've recommended a lot over the years, is the Not So Big House series of books by an architect named Sarah Susanka. And the whole premise of the book is instead of building a three, four, or 5,000 square foot house, drop a thousand square feet off whatever you think you need and then build it to a higher standard. Uh, that, that allows you to have more money to do a great WRB system, a great uh, air sealing system, better windows, better moldings and millwork, better cabinetry. Everything has more budget room if you build uh, you know, 20 or 25% smaller than what you originally thought. Yeah, so. most definitely. Good stuff. Um, kind of a follow-up to this is if you need to take 10% off the build project, meaning I got to drop, you know, whatever the whatever the price came back at on my initial estimate, gosh, that's, that's too much. We got to drop 10% of that. What can you do to accomplish this? And I put one caveat on there. Uh, it's funny, that's a number I typically use to people to say, uh, you know, if you need to drop 10% of your budget, you can typically do that in specs. 
and the ways that you build the house. But if you need more than that, you're going to have to drop square footage. Uh, so this is an interesting question. Someone must have heard me talk about that in the past. What advice do you have people in this, uh, this, this as we call it, value engineering? Yeah, I don't even want to use that word value engineering. I, you know, I really hate it because that the word value engineering, by the way, just so you know, a guy named Lawrence Miles came up with the, the idea of, of value engineering back in World War II when the Rolls Royce engine, they couldn't build the Rolls Royce engine because they couldn't get enough copper to put in the engine. Huh. So they went to this guy and said, hey, come up with a different way to build the, the Rolls Royce engine. So he did. And he came up with a way to do it with product that was available at that time. And it just so happened to be cheaper. But what did everybody remember? That it was cheaper. Not that they could build it a different way. So I hate that word value engineering. But nowadays, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, Paul, the price is too high. I need 10% out of it. I'm going to ask them what they're going to give up to get that 10%. And I'll be honest with you, right now, there's not that much money in it because the prices are fluctuating so much nowadays, there's really not. So what are you willing to give up to get that 10% out of it? And again, true value engineering means let's find a different way of doing that. And I hate to say it, never take it out of the millwork side, never, you know. Uh, But advanced framing advanced framing saves quite a bit because you know uh you're not putting a 16 inch on center you're going 24 Mm -hmm. inch center you're lining everything you can gain some product you're giving up some product yep the product's the same price that two before is still a dollar or whatever it is but you're giving up some of them yeah um you know our ready frame packages people say well the ready frame packages are, are more expensive but they are more expensive at the initial side but look how much you're saving on the trash side. Look how much you're saving on the labor side because that framer is out of that house 30% faster. Yeah, and you also get a ready frame with advanced framing too. You, you do. Know, you talk to your BFS people about doing that ready frame house with advanced framing and now all of a sudden you've saved uh, a bunch of that. Plus, uh, one thing I like about ready frame is that you build the house on the computer so you actually see the physical sticks and you're able to go, wait a minute, why is there a header and a non-load bearing gable, <laughs> right? So all of a sudden you start making a f- enough of those uh, changes, all of a sudden you built that house for less money and no one knows any different. Right, and so that goes back to what are you willing to give up so that I can get this price 10% down? And really you've given up nothing because the house looks the same. It's actually built better yep. than it would have been and in a better way because you've given up these things. Yeah. So. I would add one cautionary tale on that advice. When you say, what are you willing to give up? I want everyone to think, to hear in their mind as builders, that's what you're saying to your clients. Oh, right. great point. Uh, You know, when I say, when a client tells me, look, I need to bring 10% off this, Matt, that's when I say to them, okay, what are you willing to give up? You know, why don't we drop uh, the media room out of this house? Or instead of a media room with uh, you know, stadium seating and all this, why don't we just make it a blank room that you can finish out later as a media room? Because uh, we don't want to cut our knees off from ourselves by going with cheaper windows, by going with a less good waterproofing system on the outside, uh, by dropping solid zip system sheathing and going to cardboard sheathing, whatever it is that's important to me as a builder for my reputation, for building a solid, well-built house. I'm not gonna change any of that because you want to drop 10% out of the price of the house. Let's figure out a way to do 10% less countertops, 10% less cabinetry, 10% cheaper tile options. Let's uh, let's value engineer the plumbing uh, specs so that, you know, shockingly, there's lots of very expensive plumbing out there, manufacturers, that I think are less good than the more medium priced ones. Uh, as a quick, for example, I won't say any names, but there's a plumbing package out there. It's a very expensive one that I think is made actually less good than a standard Kohler package like I used at my house. So you can spend 50% more and get a less good product uh, sometimes when it comes to these very expensive finishes. So be really cautious about that. Now, obviously that's not gonna work for every client out there, but I think if you stack those things up, you're gonna be able to save 10%. Well, let's go back to the millwork because obviously that's how I get paid. Mm-hmm. Go back to that that original question about uh, the, the millwork side. Ask your millwork salesperson, what moldings can I get that are less expensive that look very similar? And they will have them because we bought in bulk of this one. We bought container loads of this mm-hmm. from South America where we've only bought you know uh, this by a truckload here. Yep. So. Yeah. 
it's a great point. I also heard uh, when I was in uh, Michigan not long ago, at the Michigan HBA, they had a speaker, uh, Todd with TK Design and Scott Sedum, who uh, writes a column for Pro Builder magazine. And his column is about lean uh, architecture, I think is the best way to put it, where in this presentation, they showed elevations of all kinds of houses. And then, okay, what if we were to try and drop 20% on, on the cost of this elevation, but actually make the house better looking? And what they did was they took weird roof pitches and all kinds of turn gables and all these fancy doodads and they simplified the elevations and they could easily save 10% or more on the exterior cost for the house. But those elevations, when they really thought about it, were much better looking, were much cleaner, were much simpler. Uh, so I think that there's probably an architecture component in here as well. I didn't even think about that, but you're exactly right. You know, what, what a difference between a, whatever, a, six, a 612 and an 812, what it looks like in the elevation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're exactly right, that, that element of it. And the, the amount of the differences, hey, instead of uh, doing a brick facade here, let's do a, a shake single, shingle in the gable, which makes a bricklayer cheaper because he's only having to lay brick up to an eight or nine foot plate yep. as opposed to all the way up in the gable. Yeah, so. that's right. And last thing I would add, which I, I think that the person asking this question didn't want us to go there, but I've got to go back to square footage like we talked about uh, earlier, is yeah. you know there's so many trades out there that are still basing their pricing on just a square footage metric. Uh, and I'm not going to call anybody, <laughs> anybody out, but I am thinking about a few specific trades like drywall and paint contractors that when they get a set of plans to bid, they're simply going to page one where the square footages are, and they're multiplying that by their factor and they're giving you a price and it literally takes them 10 minutes to work up a bid. So by you going from a 3,000 square foot house, 10% less, let's make this a 2,700 square foot house, you're gonna save 10% probably on your paint bid, on your drywall bid, and don't forget, that's probably also soft costs in there as well. You know, Typically builders are putting 10% uh, savings on soft costs when it comes to dumpster costs. Uh, when it comes to porta potty, all these other soft costs that are involved in the job, a lot of those are based on square footage. Your your uh, uh, builder's risk insurance, all those things, are based on footage. So by dropping that ten percent of footage, there really is real dollars. So it's funny that you bring that up. We have a builder uh, that we do a lot of business with in Arizona, and um, he did that exact same thing. He dropped the square footage on the living square footage but left it in the overall footage of the house, meaning mm -hmm. he got bigger porches. Mm -hmm. Outdoor living there in Arizona in the wintertime is big fantastic, deal. Yeah, big deal. Really nice. So his prices went down on, on the, the, the GCs that were doing square footage, yep. but actually the homeowner didn't lose out at all. Yeah, they got all this like outside they still space. Had plenty of space. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, that was my uh, deal at my house. I built a 2,800 square foot house for my family of six plus my dog. But I did a lot of outdoor living space. I have a beautiful back patio with a fireplace that I spent a lot of money on, but it doubles the size of my party space. You know, when I have people over from church, when I have friends and family over, I have a ton of space by throwing those doors open. Now, I certainly don't throw open my doors in Texas in July. Right. Uh, but, you know, we live outside in the wintertime. It's amazing. You know, typical Texas is... Uh, 55 and sunny during the day and maybe it gets a blustery 49 at night so I fire up my outdoor fireplace and I got a great party space that's I, I can't believe long. you said that because Brenda and I have a huge house not even gonna say how big it is we keep telling ourselves you know we only live in the master bedroom and the uh, the game room area and the kitchen that's it yep. the rest of the time we're outside with the outdoor patio yeah, sitting around with the with the fireplace going you yeah know? Texas so. winters are the best don't tell anybody though. yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Uh, here's here's one that I think is really going to uh, generate some interest. How do you qualify your subcontractors, and how do you hold your contractors accountable for coming back for warranty and punch list items? We have a lot of troubles getting them back after they've been paid, is the question. How would you answer that, Paul? You guys are... If I remember correctly, you're the biggest framing contractor in America. Is yeah, that right? we've, we've got to be now. We have been for years, and I'm sure we're sure we still are. 
uh, my answer to that side of it is uh, go to your uh, you know go to your contractor out there your your uh, lumber or millwork supplier and and ask if they do turnkey mm-hmm. uh, I, I, we we prefer that only because we can then control the whole thing from the initial uh, material drop to when it's going to be completed uh, and that is a way that you can get two things done if you do a turnkey is one you can get a guaranteed price up front and you know that that price is good from that point on yeah. Number two is is that uh, at least on our framing side, we don't even get paid until we get a green tag. Yeah. In other words, you get the green tag on it, and that's uh, when you get paid. So there's very little punch because we're doing all the punch to make sure you get the green we're tag. We're making right? sure you get an inspection before you get paid. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's, exactly. That's really that side of it. Then the other side of it is is that when you do have a warranty item or something, you're dealing with a with a BFS with a large company that is not going to leave you high and dry. We're going to be there for you. Yeah. And that's that side of it. Now, I don't know how to answer the subcontract side. You probably have to answer that one. But this is a this is this could be a whole uh, 45 minutes here to take us to the end. So I'll try and make it concise. But I would say that we're in a hard market to find subcontractors. This is full employment. Uh, we're as busy as we've ever been. And maybe we've slowed down a little bit since, uh, uh, you know, interest rates have risen. But in general, custom builders and uh, my colleagues that are maybe doing semi custom, we're all really busy. Our subs are all really busy. When I started my company, uh, right after I started it, we went into a big recession. You know, I started my company in 05, and then we went into that 07, 08, 09, Oof. 10. Don't bring that up. That was a great time to find subs, though, to be honest. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, even though I, I have a lot of regrets and did a lot of dumb things during that time in my life, the smart thing I did was go out and look for subcontractors. So if you're listening to this and we do end up with some stormy clouds ahead, it's not all bad. You know, frankly, I, I had a lot of good things happen to me during that period in my life. Uh, and that can be a better time to find trades. And I would tell you, too, that builders uh, are similar to subcontractors where we tend to be very, a very loyal uh, and a very uh, set in our ways in a good way. Uh, meaning when I have a sub that I like, even if they raise their prices, even if they whatever, I'm going to stick to them because I know that they're a proven entity. Uh, and I don't shop around because I don't know what I'm getting. So, you know, so something that could could be uh, advice for builders out there is, uh, number one, look to see who your competitors are using in town. And that can be as simple as driving job sites. Uh, don't expect you to make a phone call and have builders give your se- give their secrets up, though. And frankly, I've gotten more uh, uh, reserved secret- in reserved, the way. Reserved, <laughs> I guess, is the best way to say it, for sure. And that's not always because I don't want to share. Sometimes I'm reserved because I don't know who is asking and whether they're going to pay their bills on time, whether their job sites are going to be organized. And if I have an A sub who only works for other A builders, I don't know if you're an A builder asking me, so I'm hesitant, I'm reserved to give up, uh, you know, one of my trusted trades because, frankly, I don't want them to not get paid by you uh, this month. And then all of a sudden they're in dire straits and that affects my job. So asking other builders, that can be a tricky thing, but you don't necessarily have to ask them drive their jobs and you can typically figure out with a little bit of sleuthing who they're using. But the other thing you need to know is, uh, this is a relationship business, uh, and just like I've been a BFS customer for, gosh, almost 25 years now. I started using you guys uh, when I was working for a, a production builder. Uh, I think this subcontractor contractor world is a relationship business as well, uh, and so I actually uh, have very long-term uh, relationships with my trades. They trust me, and I trust them. When they make a mistake on something, especially when it comes to bidding and cost. I take care of them. I make sure that they're not left high and dry. Uh, if I have a sub who makes a mistake on a, on a bid and comes back to me and says, "Look, I totally screwed this up," uh, you know, I'm not make not only not making money on this job, but I'm losing money, and here's why. I'll make sure they're made they're they're made whole and they're taken care of because I want them around for that next job. And as I've done that over the years, that's bought me a lot of loyalty. <laughs> such that now I've got trades that have been with me for more than a decade, uh, almost all of them. And that makes a big difference. However, we did lose a lot of good trades during the uh, the COVID deal uh, because everybody got crazy busy. uh, And that took that took a lot of good companies down, frankly. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a 
uh, a sensitive issue and a bit of a time-based issue. Uh, and ultimately what it means is if you're looking for good contractors, you're going to have to spend more time on it today than you might have a couple of years ago. And vet them out, you know, you know, I, I like, time. yeah, yeah. You, you need to vet them out to know if you're getting uh, a, a primo guy or not, you know. I'll typically, uh, or I don't do this as much anymore because I've got similar trades, but what I would do in the past when I was looking for trades is I would walk one of their jobs uh, that they that they gave me a list of jobs that they've done, and I would pick one at random and go check out their work, whether that's a framer, an electrician, a plumber. I want to see what they've done. I'll also typically ask for three trade references. Hey, give me three builders uh, that you work for that that uh, that you've liked working with. Uh, and I won't necessarily call all three, but I'll certainly call one or two of them, and I'll ask them some pointed questions about them, uh, including how are they doing on their warranty and their punch and those sorts of questions. Because usually builders will be very honest with another builder. Right. I'd make those calls. That's always bothered me when somebody said, hey, give me three references that you've done, and then you don't make those calls. You're, you're fooling yourself on that. Yeah. Make those calls. Yeah, you know? that's for sure. Um, Paul, here's one for you that's a really interesting one, and we mentioned this earlier. But uh, this uh, starting out builder says, I'm interested in becoming a GC, a general contractor, and getting licensed. What are the requirements? Whoa. And I know we have an entire U.S. national audience here. Uh, <laughs> but as I said earlier, Paul, you actually hold the license for Builders First Source in uh, 22 states with 28 different licenses. Uh, as you look nationally at the licensure requirements, what can you tell a young uh, person interested in getting their GC license? So, so right off the bat, uh, I think what has helped me more than anything uh, other than being a uh, licensed engineer, I, the only thing that that did for me was allow me to take certain tests differently uh, or be able to uh, have reciprocity in that test that I don't have to take. Uh, but m me personally, if, I'm a, if I want to become a GC, I'm, I want someone and I want to be able to, to say to that person, go to work for, as a framer, go to work as a trim guy go to work as a electrician for six or eight months and learn the trade itself because you can find out so much about the trade itself by doing it actually hands-on doing it mm -hmm. i've got so many people that hey i've been a cpa for 10 years and i'm tired of sitting behind a desk i always thought it was really cool to be out there so i'm going to start building houses oh great you know <laughs> i don't want this guy you know so <laughs> keep your cpa job and you know work three days a week for as a framer yeah. and then you'll know the second part of it is is that i hate to say it but a lot of those tests are geared around businesses mm. in other words they have a business entity part of it you've got to understand the business uh, aspect of the building business mm. which is good yeah. uh, those states want a good business person out there uh, but you've got to understand the, the business acronyms you've got to understand what a PL is you've got to understand the type of business you want an llc a private right. partnership understand the pitfalls of that you've got to understand that the other side of it is is that you've got to the state that you're that you're uh, wanting to go to work in, you've got to find out what kind of education requirements you have. I, six months ago, uh, I had to go and get my uh, GC license in the state of Michigan. Now, I had 20 some odd licenses before. I have all this experience. I'm a licensed professional structural engineer, and yet the state of Michigan didn't care. I had to take 60 hours of education wow. before I even qualified to take the test. Wow. And then I had to take that six hour construction test and another four hours of a law test oh on gosh. top of that. Uh, so thank goodness I, I passed them all because my boss said, if you don't pass them, it's on your own nickel to go back <laughs> anyway. So, so I got that done, but, but you know, it was amazing the amount of stuff. Now I learned everything you would want to know about a basement and how it freezes. So I'm good on that now. But yeah. anyway, be sure and you check up on that stuff because in some states, I'm lucky that I live in the state of Texas where we have the freedom uh, that we have as a builder. But sometimes that's not a great thing. Not, right? It's not always good for our industry, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So uh, check up on it. Uh, but I, I, I really encourage you to, to get your hands dirty and be a framer, be an electrician, be a trim guy, hang some cabinets, see what the industry is like from the inside first. That's a great way to say it. Yeah, I like that. Um, let's switch gears here. I got a digital tools question for you and I. 
The question is, what digital tools are available for remodeling? Uh, let me take this one, actually. Yeah. Um, Paul, you probably know as well as anybody, but uh, for the audience out there, uh, BFS uh, acquired a company a couple years ago called Paradigm, uh, which is, in effect, a software company. And you wonder, why would a lumber yard hire a software company? Um, but now that they've un un unveiled some things, uh, they're calling them BFS Digital Tools, I really, really get it. And uh, if you've seen any of my short videos or some long videos coming out, they have some really fabulous tools that are available for remodelers and for new construction builders uh, through the BFS Digital Tools. For instance, uh, they have this product called Home Configure. I forget the exact pricing, I should know it because I just did a video on it not too long ago. But for not that much money, uh, they will take your uh, 2D plan set and your elevation and they will turn your house into a 3D rendering. Which, rendering service, okay, great. It's nice to have a rendering. But what's different about this is they call it home configure. And they can take these renderings, both interior and exterior renderings, and your clients and you together or your clients at home in their own time can press a button and go, what would this house look like uh, with white James Hardy siding? Or what if I switch that to vertical board and batten James Hardy? Or what if I switch this front uh, to a five inch lap siding or a cedar shake siding. It allows clients and builders uh, to actually visually see the differences and the changes. And I can't tell you how many clients I've got that are incredible decision makers, but when it comes to making those final decisions on both materials and colors, they're absolutely paralyzed until they see it. And this takes away that paralysis from those clients. Absolutely fantastic tools. Paul, do you have any experience with? Uh, yeah, I have. I have quite a bit of experience uh, with that part of it. But I'm disappointed in you, Matt. I'm going to say this out front to everybody that's out there. Uh -oh. You didn't say a single word about changing the door style or changing the molding <laughs> style or changing the window uh, style. Point, you know, come on. You know, we yes, have yes. Thermatrue front doors, Masonite interior, and Gelwin windows, and all this that you could change and that's and right. change all that. So I had and to you give you any one of those changes. Any one of those changes. So I wanted to give you a hard time about that. But anyway, so not only those pieces. Pieces, but what's great about that uh, that paradigm software that that we developed uh, with them uh, is is that not only that you can do that, but then you can also get the estimate and the pricing fairly quickly mm -hmm. because we ha are integrated with that That's software. And that, that and that that part of it to me is yeah. huge. Uh, the other side that uh, that you said that I'm not going to give you a hard time on is what what is a lumberyard doing buying a software company? And what's crazy about that is that everybody thinks BFS is just a lumber yard mm -hmm. uh, but as you know and as as the builders who who know us know uh, you know we're the largest millwork company uh, you know in the, the country yeah, yeah yeah so what, what, what were we talking about earlier we build 30,000 doors every day Holy you know cow. I mean can you imagine the number that number uh, have how, how many houses that is but not only the millwork but now the software side and the ready frame and the mm -hmm. trusses were you know almost a whole house solution on those parts and pieces yeah. on the on the 3d modeling we are a whole house solution so we're partnering with other parts of that uh, uh, companies as well uh, from the sinks to the countertops to the cabinets to the to the faucets and so forth so I suspect it won't be all that long Paul uh, in the future till you guys have a uh, modern day version of the Sears and Roebuck house uh, where you could literally order everything for the house uh, through BFS, or, or probably for a modern day example would be the Amazon uh, of house, uh, where by the way, if you don't know, they also have a digital uh, house library, uh, totally blank on the name, what do you guys call it now? Yeah, get, it's a digital house library. Home library, Home library. Guess, library. Is what they're yeah. calling it. Yeah. Um, which uh, I think as of this uh, recording, We'll have my house uh, that I built recently on the home library, and I'm getting ready to build another house start to finish here in Austin uh, that we're going to chronicle the series of. That one will also be available uh, in Home Plan Library, where again, you can use the home configure tool. You can see what the interiors look like. You can make all those changes to it. Uh, and for a small fee, they'll also make architectural changes for those houses as well. So you guys have really vast capabilities. So l let's back up and, and ask that same question again that was asked earlier about, hey, I need to take 10% out of this house. Mm. How can I do it? You just answered it. 
because the digital tool, you as a builder, I, I know you guys, come on, I know you guys, you guys are baking money into for the, uh-oh, I've missed that, right? 100%. You're baking that in. If you had a digital 3D model mm -hmm. that you could see all the uh-ohs in the world, huge. you wouldn't have to bake it in. There's 10% right there yeah, if you just right. think about doing that 3D modeling up yeah. front. 100%. Anyway. I had totally to throw that in. I'd throw you builders under that. So. <laughs> He's throwing us under the bus, guys. What's <laughs> up with that? Uh, okay, let's jump on to another one here. Let's talk ready frame for a minute. Um, I know you have quite a bit of experience with that as well. What are some advantages to the framers in the field? What are they actually seeing the advantages of ready frame are other than time savings? So obviously time savings for the, for the framer. Uh, but what we are seeing more and more is, is that – I don't know how to say this, that you need the less experienced framer to frame a ready frame house. Mm -hmm. Let's just say for an example, you have five uh, guys on a, a framing crew. As you know, as a builder, four of those five know everything there is to know about a 2D plan. They knew everything about, you know, hey, I've got to put a bird's mouth here. I've got to have a lookout here. I've got to, you know, cut this rafter here. I've got a king stud. I've got a jack stud, all that. They know all those terms. They're, they know exactly what to do and when to do it, right? They probably only got one guy who's schlepping lumber and, and, and a, a OSB to the second floor, right? Yep. Now, what we have found is, is that instead of having five guys who know everything about that project, you usually have one guy who knows everything about it. And then you've got, let's call them four apprentices on that job. What that does is two things. That takes the other four guys who were actually out there on that job site before, now they're become foremen with four apprentices. So we take a crew of five and we take the four that knew what they were doing. Now we have a, a four crews of one with three or four apprentices. Yep. So that does that part. The other side of that is think about those apprentices in a couple, two or three years. Then they can have to, they've done a few ready frame homes. They can start maybe even stick framing or cutting their own roofs in or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what we've also found is, is that once they start with ready frame, they don't go away from ready frame. Yeah, they want to stay with they it. They want to stay with it. They yeah. want to stay with those trusses. They want to stay with those pre-cut walls. They want to stay with all those pieces because it's a it's it's basically Lincoln logs. You yep. just match the the wood, the number on that uh, printed out wood to match that plan and put it together. Yep. Uh, it takes a little bit of, uh, of of playing with at first to get it, but once they get it, they blow and go. Uh, our stuff up in the north uh, northwest. Probably 70% of the packages that go out in the Northwest are all ready frame. Holy cow. That's 100%. High. It's high because they've been doing it for a long time, mm -hmm. for one. And number two, think about the lot space up there. Tiny. Their lots are tiny. And they know that the ready frame package is 30% less wood, so it fits in a smaller place. And they can drop off this piece, and then the next day drop off this piece, mm -hmm. and they know for a fact How that they'll have it done. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Think big, about those. Big difference in staging. Yeah. Plus, of course, the, the big one, too, dumpsters, less waste, fewer errors, more accurate. I think that's a really big deal. And, and to piggyback what you said, from a framer's perspective, you know, I think that there's this perception that, that uh, people, that framers wouldn't like ready frame. But I think from a framer's perspective, how cool would it be to have that, you know, 24-year-old former service person who went from high school into the Army and did four years, let's say, they come out, they're trying to figure out what do I do with my life? They get a job with a framer on a ready frame crew. And all of a sudden, I mean, they're nailing walls together. They're figuring this new career out, spend a couple few years with ready frame. And, and now all of a sudden they have the passion. They have the desire to learn how to do a hand cut roof, how to do all these other things. Whereas had that 23, 24 year old started out with a crew that didn't do any ready frame, they would be humping plywood. <laughs> they would be moving sticks around the job for a long period of time before they ever got to nail anything together. And I think it would be really easy to be disencouraged, to be less excited about a career as a framer. Right. I'm going to give you a really good one. So a uh, builder uh, found this framing crew that was a, a ready frame uh, guru. They've been doing ready frame for several years now. And the, the, the builder found it and said, hey, I want you to give me a price on this house and everything. Gave a price. And he says, you know, that's a little bit expensive. And the, the framer said, well, I'll tell you what, if you pay me that price, I'll haul off all the scrap on the job site. 
<laughs> and the builder goes, man, I could save 500 bucks on a dumpster, right? And everything. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end of the job, he realized that there was no there trash and he could take, take away everything in the back of his pickup truck, oh you know? Gosh. And I thought that was so good, you know? <laughs> and I asked the framer, I said, hey, how'd you come up with that? He says, I can always get away with that once. <laughs> <laughs> the second time, not so much. Not so much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, before we get off this, though, I think we should uh, we should tell people listening, where's Ready Frame available and for what kinds of builders? Is that something you can answer for us, Paul? Yeah, that's a tough one on where it's available because uh, we do have, um, uh, oh, I would have to say probably 30 or 35 areas that we have Ready Frame cut saws. It's a specific a saw that cuts and prints on the on that we have that around and we're moving more and more around the country uh, but that's probably a phone call you're going to have to make to your bfs uh, local office to find out the closest place to do it uh, to be able to get ready frame uh, the the other type of it is is that um, ready frame is very very good at duplicating the same house over and over and over and over. So if you've got a, uh, a production builder or a semi-custom builder, there is very good with that. The other side of Ready Frame that's really good is the design side of it, uh, whereas that's where the custom builder comes in mm -hmm. because we can go through with our 3D modeling and really do a, a very good job on a custom home mm -hmm. to get it ready to Ready Frame. What's good about this is, is that your homeowner uh, can make a lot of changes on that design side. And what you as a custom builder get out of this as a benefit is you tell them, okay, you, you ready with these changes? I and mean, you're done with the changes because when they hit that button, this house is gonna be completely cut and we cannot make any changes after the fact. Uh -huh. The custom builders actually like that I because uh -huh. you know that it, it speeds them up when it, it comes to framing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the then the expectation in the homeowner's like, well, wait a second, don't hit that button. Mm -hmm. Let's go back over this one more time right. and then hit the button. So, That's pretty smart. So it can use for both. It's really geared towards the reproduction of the same house over and over or the same elevation mm -hmm. over and over. The other good thing about it is, is that as you know, coming from a production uh, side of the business you have whatever 10 plans and each one of those plans has five different elevations well, ready frame is really good at that because we can build 90 percent of it all the same and then we can just change that elevation very easily right so that's really smart someone asked uh on the uh on the q a tab by the way if you have a question for paul and i that we haven't gotten to or you're interested in answering you can throw it on the q a tab we're going to make some space for those but someone on this said how soon will ready frame expand your production plants for example in texas so i'm trying to understand the question so in other words uh how quickly are you adding ready frame to other locations you said you've got roughly 30 locations in the u.s now yeah how long do you add more and is there any expansion in texas of ready frame we are adding more and more all over the country every day uh in texas uh, i think we can just about cover uh all of texas How right now Sweet. yeah uh you've maybe got, down got ready frame in houston austin yeah. san antonio dallas all over all the major metros all over the other side of of uh, bfs this is really interesting is is that just because you're in austin texas and you've got a uh house package of uh of trusses uh, roof trusses and that doesn't mean that the designer who's designing those roof trusses is in austin texas right. he right. could be in california for that matter for sure. designing them and then the other side of the coin, let's say that Austin, Texas uh, trust plant gets buried and instead of six weeks is now 10 weeks out and we've promised this builder six weeks, you can we re reach out to our DFW plant right. or our plant in El Paso right. and have them shipped over and you don't know where they came from. Yeah. So Texas uh, don't mind driving, that's for sure. <laughs> that's, that's it. I know you and I don't mind a little time behind the wheel and I think I think the rest of Texas feels the same way. Yep. Let's switch gears on a uh, on a topic that uh, we actually did a podcast on, and let's do a brief version on this. But the question is, uh, how can a builder pick out or weed out potentially bad clients? Uh, and it's interesting. This as a follow up, this this builder said, please don't say have a good contract in place. Whereas our experience is that bad clients never follow a good contract. 
Wow. That was an interesting. Uh, that they've, was, obviously, they've obviously had a problem. Well, not only that, they added that caveat. So mm-hmm. they've been down that road before. Yeah. Uh, and that's amazing that that question was on there. And we just did, you know, that podcast on that. Yeah. So uh, Paul and I did a podcast that will get published in a couple of weeks, uh, kind of a longer version of this. But I think a shorter version is uh, would be helpful to the audience. You know, how do you pick out good clients? What, what If I was just ran into your coffee shop and said, how would you? How do you weed out potential problem clients? What yeah. would you tell me? So the short version. So ten years ago, uh, I was asked uh, by a customer uh, that said, "Hey, I have just run into some problem customers, and how do I resolve these problems?" And I backed him up, and I said, "Let's stop the problem before it actually happened." And he goes, well, "Wait a second! I didn't ask you to do that. I asked you to to solve the problem." I said, <laughs> "I said, will you cause your own problem because you picked the wrong client?" Yep. And so we built a a question and uh, um, a questionnaire basically to sit and interview that pr- uh, proposed client. Uh, and then, uh, like we talked about in, in the in the other podcast, is is that it only took me a day to come up with the questions for these guys, mm-hmm. uh, but it took us three days to teach them how to actively ask the questions without being interrogated, if you mm-hmm. will. You know, mm-hmm. uh, but it's very very important to ask the right questions to make sure that that client is a good fit, number one. Number two is the other thing is, is make sure that you have set the right expectations to that client to make sure that they understand what they are getting and for what price and for what timeline. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things are very, very important. And by the way, that goes for not only you as a builder to the end customer, but you as a builder to the vendor like BFS. Uh, you need to do that as well. Yep. I tell my salespeople all the time, sometimes no is the right answer. Now, I also teach them how to say no without saying no, you know, but <laughs> sometimes no is the right answer. Yeah. So I, I, you've never had a bad client. Never though. had a bad client, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I, you know, it's funny how this builder specifically said, don't say a good contract. Uh, and I wouldn't have necessarily thought that, but I think it is worth spending a minute on contracts. Um, you know, I, in Texas, we have a, what we call a promulgated contract. The Texas Association of Builders has a standard contract for builders that are home builder association members. It's like 400 bucks for this contract package. And it is a really good contract. And it is a slightly weighted contract towards builders, I would say, uh, meaning that there's a slight benefit towards a builder. But my team and my construction attorney have made it even more onerous. <laughs> and we frankly do use that as a bit of a weed out for some clients. Uh, we've added some additional language and I've added a, a whole nother disclosure page that says, here's what you need to know about my company. Uh, here's problems we've had in the past and what to expect. It's, it's in some respects, it's an opportunity to, to set expectations properly and for you to find out if those expectations are gonna be a problem. For instance, we're, we're cost plus builders. We charge a fee. Uh, on your costs, we charge the exact costs, and we charge the exact costs whether the problem was our mistake or not. Uh, we also bill our people hourly, and we're disclosing all this ahead of time, including all their hourly fees that we charge our project managers. We bill typically on the fifth of the month, and the contract says we need to be paid, I think, on the seventh or the eighth. I can't remember if we give them two or three days, but we give that to them pretty early on in the uh, get to know you period because I want to know if they have a problem. And if they send that to their construction attorney or their attorney and they bleed all over it and want us to make 4,000 changes, we pretty abruptly say, gosh, I'm really sorry, but that's our main contract. And we've really found that this is, you know, a good contract for us. And those are expectations we need you to know about. And if you don't think you can meet those expectations, then we're probably not going to be a good fit. And I I can think of at least three clients over the years, Paul, they were super cool jobs that I really wanted. Uh, they were, you know, expensive jobs, cool architecture, and they died on the uh, contract table, which was real early on. And I found out from at least two or three of those that they hired a builder that I actually good builders, and they fired and sued those builders. And I look back and go, thank God I had a really tough contract. So, so it was really and good. They dropped out. It was really interesting how you took that question 
and took the caveat to the question and used it as a way to vet out the customer. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really good. I, and it reminded me of the section in the tab contract that's about arbitration. Yeah, That is actually one of the questions that I put in the deal, the, the questionnaire that I built for the people in Florida. What do you think about arbitration? Mm -hmm. What do you uh, like or dislike or whatever? And that's a good way to vet someone yeah. out. Yeah. The other thing that I would add to that is I always tell builders to bill for zero. What that means is, is that if you do something for free for a client, you bill them for that free, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, we changed the carpet color. Okay, you changed the carpet color and it didn't cost you anything to change the carpet color because they hadn't ordered the carpet or whatever, right? But you send that change order just yes. like any other change order, right. but you bill them for zero. Yep. Because when they come back and say, wait a second, you charged me $500 for this minor change, then you can bring up, well, you're right, I did because this was not a minor change. I was able to do this, this, and this. But if you remember, I have 18 of these build for zero that I didn't charge you that for. I didn't charge you for yeah bill for zero oh that's such a great piece of advice yeah that's great advice I appreciate that Paul um, um for the builder specifically that asked the question it probably is dealing with a hard client uh, I would just add from from my own experience I've had hard clients before it makes everything in life hard when you have that uh, personally, stress-wise, I think most of my gray has come from that. It, it made my, I can think of some times where it made my marriage, my fatherhood harder. Uh, you know, I, I, this isn't a, uh, uh, this isn't a, a religious podcast, but I would say pray. <laughs> uh, you know, I, all of a sudden I got real serious about my faith in a lot of those times. I, I reached out for Bible verses that I felt like were helpful. And I had to remember that my self-esteem didn't come from what uh, this client thought of me. Right, because that can be a really difficult time when you've got a client who's just got their thumb on you, and you know that you're married to them. Frankly, I mean, a, a building contract is a marriage, and it doesn't get better if you cancel on the contract. You know, you've got to see those through the end. So know that better days are ahead for you, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Builder, who's dealing with this, and use that as a time to galvanize your systems to go. All right, we're not going to let this happen again. Uh, do a uh, uh, a post mortem on that project. Uh, and implement those postmortems. We've been doing that since my very first project, uh, and I've sat down with those clients, almost every client, the last year or two I haven't, but prior to that, I would sit down with the clients after they've been in the house for a period of time and say, hey, let's talk about what was good in the process, what was bad, what was stressful for you guys, because I think that, that information from them is super valuable, including, you know, we picked a bad client or a, cl a bad client picked us. How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And let's really do a good job of, of making those changes. I've made a lot of those changes. And frankly, a lot of those have been memorialized in my contract now. Uh, and and I'm making sure that I'm not making the same mistake again. That That's a great point. I would, I would add to that is two things. Uh, always be honest with them and yourself and never go to bed on a problem. Meaning that if there's a problem on that job site, you make sure everybody is aware of the problem, especially that client, yep. before you go to sleep, because it'll just, it, you won't be able to sleep that That's night. Sure. I guarantee you that. Bad well, news that, first. Bad news first. And the last thing I would add, and I tell this to every salesman who will listen to me, you know, take responsibility for your own actions. Mm -hmm. If you screw something up, take responsibility for That's it, right. you know? Uh, if you do something right, take responsibility for it. But yeah. but most definitely take response. Hey, I screwed up on this. This is what I'm gonna do to fix this. Mm -hmm. This is my responsibility and I'll make it right. Yep. And that will go, it just leaves people dumbfounded. They don't know what to think. Yeah, So that's for sure. It's more rare in, in today's world, isn't it? That's for sure. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going here. This is, this is a harder one. Um, I've received info or I'm receiving info constantly where experts think the real estate market is going, but from your view, where are prices and new construction headed? <laughs> ah, that's a hard man. one. This is the old uh, forecast question. <laughs> uh, I'll take this one first. And if you okay. want to jump in on this one too, uh, you know, when I, I mentioned, I think earlier, uh, I started my company in 2005 and we had just a couple of boom years before things went absolutely terrible. I set myself up very very poorly for that time in that I took a lot of risk as a young builder, as a young husband, as a young dad, as a young business owner by doing speculative projects. Uh, and when the recession hit, I absolutely got hit with my pants down. 
uh, where I had very expensive spec houses under construction that I couldn't sell, frankly. If you've not heard my story, go back and check out my uh, early podcast where I talked about it. But coming out of the recession, I had about 300K uh, in debt, both personally and credit card and business debt that took me a long time to pay off. And as I look back on that time, I go, okay, we're in a time of higher interest rates, a little bit of uncertainty. We've got an election year coming up in this coming year. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it seems to me like things are, we still have plenty of positive out there, but this is not a great time to be thinking about speculative projects. Uh, This is not a great time to be taking on additional debt. Uh, Since 2015, uh, when I paid off that 300K, I've been really cautious about doing anything with that. I have a little bit of a mortgage still to pay off. Other than that, my entire life uh, is paid off. My entire company is paid off. I have several Chevy trucks uh, in the lot out there. I waited until I had the cash to buy every one of those. I do not own a single truck where I owe the bank on that truck. So be cautious about equipment purchases, about adding additional staff, all those things. We need to have good contingencies in place. We need to have cash reserves in place. We need to be thinking uh, a little bit cautiously uh, when the forecast is cloudy. And that's what I would say it is now. It's not that we're heading into a thunderstorm. It's just that we have a hard time forecasting what it's going to be like in 12 months. Uh, And certainly we have no idea what's going to happen in 24 or 36 months. And, you know, when we think about spec projects, buying land, building houses, None of those happen in six month periods of time. So just be cautious right now. Uh, I'm not saying that you don't invest, uh, that you don't do any projects whatsoever, but be really cautious and also get your personal life and your personal spending under control. If you're not using a personal budget or a business budget, now's the time to be on a budget so that you actually know how much money your business is making and you're paying yourself as a business owner on a regular salary that you can afford uh, and that makes sense and that you're living within your means. I, and I, I don't know what to add to that other than, you know, uh, we do a quarterly uh, podcast, if you will. We have a uh, economist, uh, Ali Wolf, that comes in. Fantastic, by the way. Yeah. You should absolutely sign on for one of those if you've not heard Ali Wolf before. It, she is fantastic on that. And for very, her very being helpful. being as young as she is, and she is one of those just brilliant people she really in, is. in general, right? Yes. Um, so to me, I get a lot of information on that. And I get a lot of, uh, of people that ask me, hey, you've been in the building industry for a long time. I'm really kind of hedging on buying a house. I've been renting for a long time. Man, interest rates at 7%. So I get two answers for them on that. Uh, the first answer is, is that, well, it, now is a really good time to buy because there are more homes available That's right. on the new home construction. Not yeah. so many on the on the second home because nobody wants to sell their home they're living in because <laughs> they don't want to buy, they don't want to pay 7% yeah. and they've got 4% that they're yeah. paying on. And, and I always tell, they go, well, it's 7% interest. And I say, you're right, it is. And that's a lot more than four or 5% what you could have gotten, but it's either going to stay this way or go down. And they go, wait a second, what do you mean by that? It could go up. I said, you're right. It could go up, but not today. Yeah. What I'm saying is, is that if you find something you you can afford, you get in it now because you can always refinance it later. Or if interest rates continue to climb, you're you're in the you know, the catbird seat, right? right. You got that low interest rate when it was there. Uh, And so two of the people that asked me that, both of them bought houses, one a townhouse and one a regular uh, Mm -hmm. single family home. And both of them said, yeah, I paid six and a quarter or whatever. But the second one that bought a new home, the other one was a new home, but it was finished. The the second one was a, a single family home. They negotiated with the builder and the builder bought down the note and got it down to five and a quarter. How about that? Yeah. So That's those awesome. are also available out there. Those builders want to sell those houses like you're pay saying. Pay a couple of points. Pay a couple of points and yeah. get it down. That's so, a great point. Anyway. Yeah. No pun intended on the points. The other thing, too, I would just mention is, you know, I've only been in the business uh, since 95 was when I started as a professional builder. But my business partner, Tim Hill, is about 15 years older than me. Uh, so young guy. He, young young guy. guy. Exactly. Yeah. Young guy. Uh, so he was building houses in the 80s when people were paying 13, 14, 15% mortgage interest rates. And so when you think about uh, the perspective of 
somebody who's been in the business more than more than me, and I'm almost three decades in, they're thinking, well, seven percent that's not that bad. That's still relatively good interest rates and every one of those people who paid that 13 and 14 percent refinanced that house two or three times uh down the road that's right you know and got it down to the four or five and i'm not a big market timing guy i think that uh timing the market is is stupid frankly and then it's not worth doing uh you know for the for the builders out there who don't own their own house yet buy a house it doesn't matter when uh there's the good the good time to buy a house is today uh, you know, you buy a house, even if it's at 7%, rates go down, great, refinance. But now you own a house, you're not paying rent to someone, you actually have a place to plant yourself. Uh, you know, I bought my last house in 2007, right at the freaking peak of the marketplace. <laughs> and Sound then, like me. <laughs> and then I remodeled it and put 150000 into it right away. So I was totally underwater in terms of the neighborhood. But yet I lived in that in that house for 15 years. I loved it. My family loved it. And when I sold it, look, the market came back and I was able to sell that and make a great profit. I sold it for you know, more than double what I had into it. So for those who are like, oh, you should time the market and buy when it's low and sell when it's high, that's frankly, that's stupid. By buying today and by, by being a builder, you're betting that the overall American economy is gonna do well over time. And everybody since World War II who's done that has won the bet. Right. Is if you're doing things short term for a one year or two year, you can absolutely lose. But if you do things for the long term, you're going to be fine, which frankly goes back to my philosophy that we should be owning and building houses for the long term. Uh, and one of your questions I, I uh, will get into on, on the podcast time that if you guys should go back and listen to that is, you know, a great question to ask your buyers is, is this going to be the last house you build? And if it's not, how long do you plan to live here? Because someone who's buying a house to sell it in two years is going to make very different decisions than someone who thinks they're going to live there a decade. Whether they actually live there a decade or more is to be seen. But if they think they're going to live there a decade, they're going to make a very different decision. I, I like to think of it as a difference between builders that are owned by a New York Stock Exchange and builders that are owned by a family. You know, a family owned business, I think, makes much better decisions than a builder who's owned by the stock market and has to make quarterly results and has to do dumb things to satisfy whatever the stock market tells them that the big bosses need to do. And that was one of the frustrating things for me working for a national production builder was that we felt like we had to make the same amount of insane profit quarter after quarter and we always had to get better. And so we made the houses cheaper and cheaper to build every year and not in a good way. Whereas when you're a custom builder, when you own your own company, when you're building your own house, you make decisions for the long term for you, not decisions based on someone else's desire for you. So building long term, thinking long term, that's why we're such a great country. Great, great. Good point. Um, we've got two questions and then we're going to knock this off because we're already over an hour, Paul. Uh oh, <laughs> OK. Uh, this one's actually for me. This is Bill Bryce. And Bill says, Steve and Jake on the Build Show Network have been highlighting raft insulated subfloors on a slab top. If you don't know what this is, wow. I actually did it at my house so I can speak from experience here. I have a slab on grade house. I actually remod. I was going to remodel my house and then ended up building a new house. Uh, and so I have this slab that I basically built a new house on top of. I'm in a real rocky part of Austin. There's no expansive soils. It's a nice 70s rebar, uh, you know, true rebar, not a post tension slab. Had no problem. So I built a new house on an old slab, 50 year old slab, brand new house. But here's what I did to really bump the efficiency was after my house was framed, I put an uh, inch and a half of EPS, pardon me, inch and a half of GPS foam. That's graphite right. polystyrene foam. It's, it's kind of. Uh, uh, graphite like pencil lead colored and then on top of that i put two layers of three-quarter advantex subfloor and i glued and screwed them together and i did them uh, perpendicular to each other so i ran all my sheets horizontally and then i went 90 degrees and ran the top sheet glued and screwed them together and steve calls this a raft uh, slab where you basically have a subfloor that just floats over your slab and the only thing separating the two is an inch and a half of insulation I absolutely love it. And to answer your question, Bill, uh, is this a long term? Uh, uh, will this hold up long term, uh, including things like furniture, appliances and non load bearing walls? 
my house is a perfect example that I've been in my house two years now and my raft slab is working perfectly. I have no issues. I have no cracks. I have no issues whatsoever. It's been absolutely fantastic. However, I would give the caveat that I do have hardwood floors uh, on top of that. So I actually kind of have a third layer of actual stiffening on top of that raft slab. Uh, and I love that my floors have a little bit of give, you know, the difference between walking on concrete and the difference, uh, of walking on a, you know, a framed two by 10 first floor, your knees feel so much better on that wood floor. The same is true on my raft slab. It feels like I've got a full basement underneath me and I've got just a little bit of give. And so even my 51 year old knees, man, they feel great on top of that raft slab. So, so the the first two benefits i can think of is uh, uh, the one was the softness of it i thought about that uh some insulation value on, on that yep. uh the other thing would maybe be uh no wicking issues if any that you may have on an older slab yep. that may not have a, a barrier a correct right. barrier in it i was able to put a vapor barrier on top of on the top insulation. yeah yeah that yep. that part of it that that's the only thing is is that that's not a retro that's something you got to think about when you're framing because you framed yeah. it up you got to add an extra plate or something to, to accommodate yeah, for that you got to think about your stairs right if you didn't think about it your stairs would be way off way off yeah so yeah. you can't retro it you gotta you gotta be do well you could retro it but you'd have to do a whole house where oh, you yeah. actually replace the stairs as well right because uh, i've got uh inch and a half of insulation which is like an r6 or an r7 i used halo intera on mine which already had a vapor barrier bonded to that top layer. So I simply taped the seams and then I taped from there to my bottom plate on the outside to okay. make it continuous. And now I've got a continuous vapor barrier on a slab that never had one. Interesting. And hmm. it works great. Never heard of that. A bit so of a mind blower. I bet so I'm thinking about that. And in Texas, you get uh, a little bit of a benefit from your slab in the summertime in that typically the ground is colder. So you're kind of taking heat out of the house. You have a cold slab. However, in the wintertime, it's the opposite. You want a heated oh, yeah. tile floor, right? Because, you're, uh, because your body heat is being sucked out of your body into the floor below. It's going to feel cold, especially in your sock feet. Uh, so in my house, uh, I put a heated tile floor in my master, which is on the first floor. I almost never use it because I don't feel cold at all on my tile because I don't have concrete underneath that. I've got subfloor and then insulation. Interesting. So you used a tile board instead of one of the layers no, on put, top of the layer? Uh, well, in my case, I've got, uh, you know, original 70s slab, inch and a half of GPS foam, two layers of three quarter Advantec, and then I did the Schluter Ditra system, if you're oh. familiar with that. It's an yep. uncoupling mat. Mm -hmm. And then I put my tile on top of that. Okay. Okay. And I haven't had a single crack or problem or issue whatsoever. And I did heated Ditra and I do use it occasionally. But most of the time, I don't need it. It's it's almost too hot uh, that's interesting. with that heated tile floor. Whereas most people in Texas, that's a huge upgrade. People love the heated tile floor because in the wintertime, yeah. the tile on a slab on grade is friggin' cold. It is cold. It's I got that. Cold. Yes. Yeah, that's most people. Right. Paul, you are the most interesting man in the building world. We learned today that you are... Uh, you hold 28 licenses. I also didn't know that you were actually a structural engineer. You you kind of slipped that in during our uh, our last 60 minutes. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. You're the VP of Innovation and Millwork. Uh, you've uh, owned a plywood and millwork company before. Uh, you've done a little bit of everything, and you're just shy of 40 years in the business. Thanks you? thanks to my dad uh, who uh, got me nailing cabinets together when I was probably 12 years old, you know, so, uh, uh, and, and, uh, so I, you know, it's crazy. He told me, he said, Hey, I'm going to send you to college so you don't have to be in this construction business. <laughs> and, uh, he always used to introduce the three of us, my brother and sister and myself. Well, this is my uh, oldest son. He's a chief pilot for, uh, Southwest airlines. And this is my sister or my uh, daughter. She is a, uh, the CBO of Tuesday morning. And, oh that. yeah, this is my uh, other son. Uh, he's a forklift driver for, a lumberyard you know, so. <laughs> a forklift anyway. driver i love it <laughs> so anyway and for my nerdy builder friends out there we also found that he's got three phase power in his shop so that he can run his yeah, man. shaper <laughs> and his five horse uh bessemer it's, table it's more saw, it's, it's more cabinet saw. it's more efficient you know so it's more efficient anyway paul you're awesome man Great i really stuff. appreciate hey, it hey we're going to be together again aren't we i've almost forgot our last thing yes uh, our friend Armando Cabo, who's an architect in the DFW area, 
has a uh, DFW Building Science Day that BFS is also sponsoring. It's on November 15th, actually the day after my birthday. Allison Bales is going to be there, Nikki Kruger, you and I, Armando. It's a full day of building science training. Um, how can people find out more about that or get registered? Yeah, uh, uh, what I understand is is if you go to Building Savvy Magazine, uh, they'll have a link there to be able to register. And the early bird uh, pricing is still available from what I understand. Uh, so I, I'm excited because I get to be around a bunch of building science people. Bunch of nerds. Uh, yeah, learn <laughs> learn a bunch of stuff about that. So, uh, and so you I'm could, excited about that. You could that. also reach out to Armando on LinkedIn. It would be another great choice, too. I know he's on LinkedIn. He, he actually was gigging me before we started that I hadn't accepted his LinkedIn uh, <laughs> uh, contact or whatever. That's I'm only funny. on LinkedIn about every two or three months. So, Armando, if you're listening, sorry, buddy. We're still <laughs> friends. Don't, don't take my lack of LinkedIn uh, uh clicking yes by to mean actually anything uh big thanks to bfs obviously for uh, supporting the build show and for paul driving down from dallas to be on with me check out our podcast we've got coming up and if you're watching this uh later on video by the way sign up for our newsletter there'll be a link somewhere below to sign up for our newsletter my team sends a newsletter uh email to you on tuesdays and fridays that says Here's what's new on the website, because we're up to like 13 new videos a week now, plus our live events like this one where you can actually ask questions and see us live. Uh, with that being said, Paul, I appreciate you being here. I, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. It was, it was good fun. I enjoyed it. Was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. From the Rockwell Studios in Austin, Texas, follow us on TikTok or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.